19th, and this is the 2015 Facilities Geospatial Technology Showcase. This six-month webinar series is hosted by the Campus Facilities Technology Association and organized by the University of Kentucky. I'm Michelle Ellington, and thank you to all of our attendees joining us today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Both the recording and slides will be made available on the CFTA website. The presentation is estimated to run 45 minutes, with the remaining time dedicated for Q&A. Feel free to send any questions during the presentation using the questions dialog box. Your question will be added to the queue and answered at the end or as time allows. I want to extend a special thank you to today's presenter, Devon Miller. Devon serves as a Building Commissioning Administrator for the Western Michigan University's Engineering Division. He will be presenting on utilizing BIM and facilities management for new and existing campus buildings. Devon, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Well, good uh, morning, everyone. Um, as Michelle said, my name is uh, Devon Miller. Um, and I'm the Building Commission Administrator for Western. And I'd like to work here. Here's a little background information on myself. Um, basically, I've been with Western here for about a year and a half, one or two years. Um, basically, I oversee all the commissioning um, for all the new buildings on campus um, for existing and new as well. Today, I'm going to give you um, some quick fast facts about Western. Um, basically, our organization set up for FM. Then I'll get into um, how we're utilizing them for new construction and how we're utilizing them for existing buildings. So a little bit about Western. Uh, we're established back in 1903. We have roughly over 24,000 uh, students enrolled. Um, that equates to about 1,200 acres, 167 buildings, 8 million square feet of university space. Uh, we house around 5,400 students, and about 39 miles of sidewalk and 26 point five. 26.5 million miles of roadway and about 49 miles of utility grade. And we basically have two campuses. We have our main campus, which is uh, comprised of our east and main, and then we have our Parkview campus, which is our College of Engineering. Our FM department is roughly 457 employees. Um, in 2013, we did roughly around 50,000 work orders. We have roughly around 20,000 PM maintenance orders, and we have roughly around 17 million of KWH electricity, and uh, 510 million pounds of steam. This kind of gives you an organizer chart of our FM department, which pretty much comprises of five divisions. We have our administrative division, our engineering division, our planning division, projects, projects and construction, and our operations. Now I want to um, kind of focus on our new construction. Uh, what you see here is a couple of our capital, uh, capital projects going on today. Uh, in the top half of there, you're seeing our East Hall. That's the birthplace of Western. Um, right now it's going through a renovation, which you're seeing top right. And then the, below is our new Red Hall. Um, Western has, an, has not constructed any Red Halls in the last 50 years. So this is the first Red Hall that we're uh, now building here on campus. And this kind of gives you some overview of some of the capital um, construction projects that we currently have going on. Some have been recently completed over the last two summers, uh, but kind of gives you an idea of you know, roughly um, the dollar uh, for some of the capital construction that we have going on our campus. So before we can really utilize them, we had to kind of create a roadmap. So our roadmap to the building process is our BIM execution plan. So today, um, I'm not going to go through the whole execution plan. I'm just going to touch on some of the key points that I found that should be in your BIM execution plan if you don't already have one. So, um, so one of the things that uh, we found that's important to have in a BIM execution plan is basically uh, your BIM goals, project goals, and how you intend to utilize them. So let's look deeper in that. So 
10 goals, where are they? Well, for Western, uh, one of the things that we're looking for is the base model that um, our construction team receives from the architect we want to be of a level uh, LOD 300. Um, that is used um, as the coordination model for all the trades um, for mechanical, fire protection, plumbing, et cetera. Uh, we also want to make sure that um, all information associated with the equipment that we're going to maintain, it gets incorporated into that uh, model as well. Then uses, um, we pretty much tailor each one of our projects, you know, um, accordingly. So all, we're showing, all I'm trying to show you here is that you pretty much can pick and choose how you intend to use the BIM model. If you're going to use it for site analysis, if we're going to use it for cost estimation um, and so forth. So this kind of gives you an idea that, you know, we try to tailor our bin use for each project that we do on here on campus. Next, collaboration procedures. Um, here, you know, this kind of gives you an idea of the type of meetings that should be held. Um, this, we just kind of give a suggestion, but it's really up to our construction management team to determine how often these meetings are going to be held. But one of the most important meetings that we found is they have a BIM requirements kickoff meeting. Um, that's usually done once. And as a meeting is mixed, it's, that meeting is primarily set up to make sure that all parties are on the same page. Um, they give you some ideas, some other ones, the uh, BIM execution plan demonstration, design coordination, constructability coordination, and life cycle BIM planning. Now here at Western, uh, we don't really have a document management system, but what we do have is that we do try to have, um, we have like a file naming convention that we want everyone to adhere to um, that makes it easier, us, easier for us to retrieve and file um, documents. So here it kind of gives you an idea of what that looks like. Uh, field one, we always, you know, try to isolate that as being our building number. Field two is usually the discipline if it's a structural, electrical, mechanical, so forth. Field three is usually our project number and a description. Field four is any kind of document revision of that particular document. And field five is usually the date. The technology research requirements, this is really critical that we found, especially when you're going through the BIM process, to make sure everyone's on the same page as far as which version of software that uh, the teams are using, the parties are using. So for our design offering, um, right now we're currently using um, Revit 2014. Um, so this, all we're trying to see here is we just want to make sure that everyone's using the same um, version of software. Um, I, mean, I know many of you know that if the base model is in Revit 2014, but you know the other parties are using Revit 2013, you can't coordinate because the two can't talk to each other. So it's really important that all the parties are using the same version of software to ensure that the coordination is done seamlessly. Coordination uh, methods for class detections, um, they're using Navisworks Manage. Same thing, um, 2014. And the owner, uh, we're using for our life cycle, the federate model that gets turned over to us at the end of the project, we're using 2014. Delivery strategies, level of development. Um, yeah, I'm not going to spend too much time on because I'm pretty sure most people on the, on the call here you know um, the level of development, but you know, LD100 is pretty much just a breeding model. Um, 200, you're, you know, basically trying to specify. 300 is more, you can do your shop drawings. 400 is more for fabrication. Where Western is for new construction, we're at LD500. So the federate model that's turned over to us, we expect it to be up to a 500 level because we're using that to maintain the facility. Now, with our BIM execution plan now, all we're showing here, or trying to show illustrate here, is that with the BIM process, is more of an uh, interaction um, process, whereas 
uh, the all that guy is more of a linear process where you know, we have a document and then use that, you know, if there's any changes out in the field, there's a lot of R5 change orders. With the BIM process, what we have seen is that the number of RFIs have been reduced because you're now able to do that collaboration out in the field to basically offset some of the things that normally you don't see to later on do the correct construction process. So now with the BIM, you're able to see some of those things up front and you can kind of reduce construction or you can reduce construction time as well as the number of RFIs that you need generated. Most of what I've been processed, there's some um, specific information parameters, if you want to say, of things that we want our equipment to have. And so this is really critical. So what I'm basically going to illustrate here is what we're looking for for our air distribution system. So for a typical air handler, uh, we're looking for these specific parameters. So these are information that we want to make sure that the contractor that incorporate into that piece of equipment. So we're looking at, uh, we have an asset tag number, um, the description, what type description, location, manufacturer, serial number, filter information, filter size, sequence of operation, on and manual, and the submittal. Within that air handler, there's typically a supply fan. That supply fan has a motor. So this is some more information that we want to make sure that is incorporated um, into the bid model for that piece of equipment, as well as as a return fan. So, you know, we're very thorough about what information that we want, that we find that this information is helpful for our skilled trades as they try to maintain these pieces of equipment. Um, this is nothing new. Um, I mean, most of you that are using a lot utilizing them right now, is this is kind of illustrating a coordination, coordination meeting. Um, this is a coordination meeting that we have um, for our new rest hall project. And so it kind of gives you see that, you know, gets everybody into a room and, you know, we're all looking at the BIM model, understanding all the clashes, you know, what things that we can do to solve that clash. Now, what, uh, the thing that is new to us is that, you know, class infection is not new nothing new to them, but one of the things that we get now is we get a class detection report. Uh, we didn't get that in the past. So now uh, we do get a you know a monthly report that kind of summarizes the clashes. You know, where are the clashes happen the most is between electrical and plumbing and between electrical and HVAC. And, and we kind of get a summarized uh, summarized report of the clashes, how many clashes have been found, how many have been resolved. And that's kind of what you're seeing here. Now, I'm going to switch over to what we're doing for um, our existing build buildings, which is a little slightly different. So what you're seeing here, this is our College of Health and Human Services. This building was built back in 2005. Um, it was uh, certified as a lead gold building for our campus, for our EBOM. So basically what I'm going to do is show you how we went from Prints to 3D to our 3D model, how we were able to add and maintain mobile mechanical equipment into the model, and how we were able to connect that model to our um, computerized maintenance management system, or CMMS. So first, um, you know, going from prints to modeling. Um, prior to 1995, we had around 107 buildings around 6.19 million square feet. Those are the original blueprints. We basically convert those blueprints to a standardized simple floor plan. So from 95 to 2000, which is about you know, 520 floor plans, we convert those to an auto you know, a simple, simple floor plan. From those simple floor plans, we were able to incorporate it into Revit, you know, from 2011 to 2013, to generate our 3D models. I understand these models are just basic white boxes. There's nothing in them. So um, students spend more time, you know, on the exteriors than on the interior. Um, because the whole idea was to kind of get the naked building actually look like in the model, how it looks out, you know, if you're actually looking at it outside. So 
As you can see here, time length from 2011 to 2013, we did 138 existing buildings that we modeled in uh, three year of it. And like I said, the white box is nothing. You know, our students use generic library, so the slides, the columns, the windows, the stairs, that's all the rivers and rabbit and generic uh, library, that's what we use to um, model the book. Now that the buildings are modeled, the next step is to add the mechanical equipment to uh, that building. Now before we can do that, we have to understand, get a better understanding, what equipment do we want to add? So, you know, we looked at it from the standpoint is what are the pieces of equipment that our skilled trades touch the most on a frequent basis? So based on that, we came up with these 12 pieces of equipment. So we're only looking at air conditioning units, condensing units, air handlers, air compressors, tillers, pumps, cooling tower, exhaust fans, supply fans, sump pumps, and return fans. Now, all this information, you know, about these pieces of equipment is in our CMS system, but there's over 100 parameters, you know, associated with that piece of equipment. So we don't want all that information. We just want the information that's according to our trades. So we, you know, basically interviewed them, you know, looked at all of our trades. We have nine shops, roughly 110 skilled trade people, and basically asked them, what information is critical to you to be able to maintain that piece of equipment? So from that information, we would narrow, narrow down those 100 plus parameters to 20 parameters. And that's what you're seeing here. So basically, we're just trying to get the description of the location, um, the description of the equipment, the location of the equipment, the tag number of the equipment, the manufacturer, model, serial number, and so forth. Those are, that's the information that our skill trades that they need to be able to properly service through that piece of equipment. Now the next thing, now that we have, you know, as it developed, you know, what the parameters were, we need to audit our CMS system to make sure the information in our CMS is accurate. Because as you guys see, you know, things get changed out in the field a lot. A uh, pump gets replaced, a motor gets replaced, and so forth. So what we basically do for every for each building, our PMS scheduler will basically give our students uh, a list of the parameters for that particular building, and our students will take that information go on to the field and field verify the information. So you see it here, one of our students, they will go out and basically locate that piece of equipment, verify that the information um, from our senior mass is accurate. And if the information is not, we basically um, make the changes on the spreadsheet and give that information back to our team schedule so that she can update the information in our senior mass. The other things our students do, students do is they actually take pictures of the equipment to make sure that they actually have the right piece of equipment. So each one of our equipment, as you've seen here, have a, have a barcode. Um, so that's what they use to make sure that they found the right piece of equipment because that's what's used as a matching parameter. Um, they also use the iPad to kind of sketch a general location of that piece of equipment so that when they come back, you know, they can put it in the right location with their model. And that's what you're seeing here. So basically, they you know, get a general idea of where that piece of equipment is located, and they sketch it right there in the iPad. Next thing that our students do is now they have, you know, they, have, they found the right piece of equipment, they will basically come back to the office here, and then they will go to that particular equipment manufacturer and see, you know, if there's a model there. If, uh, you know, if what you're looking at here is a bell and got the pump. So they actually pull the right, you know, uh, model for that specific pump. In other cases, the manufacturers, especially, you know, we have units here that are, you know, fairly old. There may not be a model um, for the manufacturer. So sometimes our students will actually create the model from blueprints, uh, basically take the dimensions that are on the blueprint and help them build a model. Other times, you know, simply take a picture and model it from a picture. And those um, pieces are stuck in a library, um, so they can go and plot that information into our models at a later date. Then the next thing they do is they um, create a mechanical equipment schedule in Revit. And as you're seeing here, the top 
you know, that's the 20 parameters that I showed you guys before. So it basically uses those 20 parameters to place the, uh, the mechanical schedule in Revit. Now, as you see here, this is that white box I'll tell you about in all of our buildings. There's no information, nothing there. So once they go through, they do the field work, get the equipment located, um, build the models. Next thing is, is to input those models into, input those libraries, the models from the equipment they uh, model into Revit. So this is before. This is after. So after they do the field verification, they go through and they add all those pieces of equipment into Revit. Now we pick red um, to basically make the equipment pop so that you know if you're looking at, at our models, if you see a red item, then most likely that's a piece of equipment. So that's why you see everything there in red. It's just more just to highlight that, that it's a piece of equipment. Now we've got mechanical schedule. Like I was telling you guys before, one of the critical things for us is to determine what is going to be the matching parameter that's going to be used to sync our Revit model with our CMS. And what we determine the best thing is our asset tag. So that's what you're seeing there. Um, basically, uh, 083 is our building number. Uh, CWPH is uh, chill water. The age four is the total number. So that's what's used to match um, with our CMS system. So in summary, from the timeline we're using from 2014 to 2016, we're looking to take all of our existing buildings, develop the um, Revit models that are already were done, add those pieces of equipment to them. So that's roughly 138 buildings. We're looking at roughly around 2,700 um, attainable pieces of equipment. And we're hoping to get that done within the next couple of years. So now the next step is, now that we have the equipment into our Revit model, the next step now is to take the Revit model with our CMS database. So what does that look like? Like I was saying, we basically have two silos. We have all of our BIM models in one silo, and we have all of our equipment in our CMS silo. So we're looking at around, roughly around 55,000 pieces of information that have to be exchanged between one to the other one. So one of the things that we did, we leveraged our relationship with our current CMS um, vendor, which is we're using uh, WebTMA. Uh, they've been our uh, CMS vendor for over 15 plus years. So we've had a really good relationship with them. So we reached out to them to see if they could develop some type of interface between um, their web TMA and Revit. And what they were able to do was work with Autodesk, and they came up with a, um, an add-on tool for Revit. So what you're seeing here, is a web TMA interface add-on tool that they developed with all of that for Revit. So basically all we would do is log into Revit using our same credentials that we would if we were logging into our web TMA. So you log into them simultaneously and create the link. So what basically we would do, we go and you click on the web TMA interface, you select the same data. And when you do that, you can pick where we built with building you want and the template, which is going to be equipment, which you're seeing here. And then a list of equipment will show up for that particular building. Then what you want to do is you can then import or export the data. Now the uh, thing to remember is Revit is what is used as the portal. So if I'm exporting, I'm exporting out of Revit into TMA. If I'm importing, I'm importing from TMA into Revit. So once again, what you're seeing here, 
in Snyder Hall, when our students went through at all the equipment to Snyder Hall, they established connection between logging into Revit and login to our TMA. Um, they did exchange data, they picked the building, they picked the template. So when it first comes up, the only thing you're seeing right now is the matching parameter, which we're using the equipment tag. So the WMU tag ID will choose as the matching parameter. Then all they would do is basically hit import. And then when they hit submit import, you're going to see what happens. Everything is possible right there in Revit with the click of a button. Uh, because we were able to establish that linking, uh, that matching parameter, so the, every, all that data knows where to go for that piece of equipment. You also can export information, uh, which you'd like to see here. So when the information is entered, you're seeing that. But if um, things are done out in the field, if it's all things changed, a motor has changed, or any kind of thing is done by our skilled trade, we can then update our CMS when I have to go out here to you know, feel verified. Uh, basically, all we would do is export the information now. So if that exhaust fan that you're seeing here, the two exhaust fans out there, let's say they'll change out in the field, all we do is hit export, and voila, the information is updated in our CMS. Um, and then, like I said, what we basically use now, all of our skilled trades have iPads. Um, and we're using the 360 Glue, so they're able to use those iPads and be able to get all this information at their fingertips without having to sit at a computer terminal. So basically, they will basically upload um, that the model using our file finder software tool, and the model will upload to their iPad, and the same thing. They can simply walk through the building without having to leave the comfort of their office, uh, their vehicle, as long as they have a Wi-Fi connection, um, they can then pull up the information, click on that piece of equipment, and get all that information before they even leave their shop. So therefore, they can have, make sure they have the right filters, the right belts, and so forth if they're going to go service that piece of equipment. So that kind of taps into why we really went this, um, with this process. Well, before, you know, when we were processing work orders, where our trades were processing work orders, any time that there was a service was in the uh, piece of equipment, there was always a time delay because they had to get the information. And so a lot of times, they would go to our document room and try to find that information, especially the own and name they didn't have in their shop. And a lot of times, it was just hard to find that. So there was always delay. Um, from a time standpoint on being able to process that work order because they're constantly trying to find the information they need to be able to service that piece of equipment. Now with the tools that we're now using with the ability to link our BIM models with our CMS, also the fact that they have the iPads and they have the BIM 360 Glue app on their iPads, they're able to get the information a lot quicker, um, which then uh, reduces the time to service that piece of equipment. So the process has really uh, been shortened now that they have all that information that they need at their fingertips. So what we're being seen basically, you know, we're um, in a VR trades, what we're guessing um, as far as savings go, we're seeing that, you know, with the BIM process in place, for our preventive maintenance, that we're going to reduce our hours down from 85,000 from previous to roughly around 80,000. Um, with our service calls, we're looking to reduce uh, with our previous process from 67,000 down to 57,000. So overall, we're looking for uh, labor efficiency improvement by 7% or roughly $500,000 per year. So the takeaways I have for everyone from how we're utilizing the process is one, for new construction, basically create your your roadmap. In our case, our roadmap is our BIM execution plan. Two, make sure you get that into your PSA agreement. 
three, and that, I really highlight this, have a kickoff meeting because really you want to set the expectation for all parties involved of what, how you as the owner, you know, what information that you want this critical to you as the owner so that all the, all the parts are on the same page. Determine the gatekeeper for who is going to manage the BIM model. Now, each project is going to be different. And the majority of our projects, the gatekeeper is our construction manager in most cases. Um, other times, it may be a need. You, the, you as the owner, will have to determine who has the better skill set to be the gatekeeper for each project. And like I say, for the majority of our projects, that has to be our CM. And then truly understand that your BIM execution plan is a living document. It's constantly going to change. Um, as you learn more and more about BIM, um, you know, your um, document is going to evolve over time. Um, right now, we have, we're at version 14 with our BIM execution plan. For existing buildings, Basically understand that the models do not have to be highly detailed. And that's really critical. Like I said, for new construction, we're looking at a um, level of de a level of development of 500. For existing buildings, we're only looking at you know anywhere between one to 200. I would say more like 250. Define what means the table piece of equipment that you want to add and its associated parameters. Um, like we did, we want to only focus on mechanical. We don't have any electrical, we don't have any stuff work, we don't have any piping, we don't have any of that because we want to start small. So I would say focus on starting small and then grade, gradually increase as you go forward. So phase one for us is just adding the equipment. Phase two, we need to look at electrical, you know, plumbing, we're not for sure yet. Um, but just start small. Phase three, we are the next step is all your CMS data in the field while you're locating your enable piece of equipment. Um, make sure that you know the information that you have in your database is accurate. And it kind of fits in if you're doing if you're if you have using the utilizing like schemes like we are uh, to help us with this process, you can easily, you know, um, validate the information while they're out in the field locating the pieces of equipment. Another thing is that if you're unable to find a 3D model for that piece of equipment from um, the various manufacturers, then just create them from scratch. And then work with your current CMS vendor. Um, I'm pretty sure that you know if you guys have long relationships again. We have with WebTMA, they'd be more than help, I think they'd be more than happy to be able to create that link knowing that you know that they probably get this to other universities um, and you can see you know um, some excitement there for that to help you guys develop that tool. And the final stands for being team made data management. You know, um, that would be the next other thing to take away from this. So with that, that kind of ends um, my presentation and hopefully I can answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Devon. That was um, a very complete presentation. I think that you you made it look easy. You skimmed the surface. You did the bullets, which I think a lot of us need. Um, here at the University of Kentucky, this is very important to us. We're trying to, you know, strategize, um, you know, a five-year BIM migration plan, maybe longer, maybe shorter. But learning from you is um, extremely valuable to our process. So thank you for taking the time to lay it out so clearly. No problem. I do have um, a couple questions for you. Um, one is, is your Revit modeling done in-house? And if so, how did you migrate your existing staff over from using AutoCAD? Okay. Good question. Um, for all of our existing buildings, yes, that is done in-house. Like I said, we've been, uh, we've been fortunate enough to utilize students. Um, right now, we do have three students that make up our BIM TMA team. Um, and they come from, you know, our engineering background. Um, so they've been very helpful. 
and have um, using that using that. So um, so right now we're using Revit. Um, so like I said, most of them we're just basically linking the simple floor plans that we, that were done as I showed it from simple floor plans that were done in AutoCAD and basically link them to our Revit. So you mentioned that for existing buildings, you really sh there's no need to keep those highly detailed. But yet, you know, the modeling that you're doing with a piece of equipment does seem highly detailed. And you know, I personally have seen some BIM facilities models quote that are going in the trend of showing an air handling unit as a cube with attributes. Where do you see the benefit in modeling a piece of equipment with detail as opposed to just using that cube with attributes model? Hmm. Yes, that's a good question. I'm not for sure. I know um, from what we've been doing is I know you can do uh, one or either way. Um, we, I think, from a knowledge standpoint, I think mean, for us, our students just spend more time, you know, spending details on the building, and then I think they've been really trying to and going to integrate. They're trying to make the equipment look as close as possible to what's out in the field to make it easier for if a maintenance person or anyone that does not have a mechanical background to be able to understand what they're looking at. So they may take it to the next level um, just because that's how they how they are. They're very highly detailed students. And so I think they just, you know, took it on themselves and say, you know, we want to make this thing look as closely as possible to what's actually here in the space. It's an interesting thought, though, isn't it? It's a, I, I believe I saw that at CFTA um, from a, a vendor, and they were just showing a cube, which does decrease the size of the model. But you don't get that clear picture, of course. Um, another yeah. question for you is about, you know, you mentioned your ROI clearly demonstrated in labor efficiency. Can you speak about a time where you used a BIM model to support building maintenance in a way that you know really validated your migration to BIM and further demonstrated your ROI. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I can. Um, I think it was one of the. I know it's one of the situations where our PM staff, um, cause they've been waiting to get this training, <laughs> and right now that's what we're, that's what we're um, working on right now is getting them trained on the the BIM 360 Glue uh, app. But I know it came up once with our new building Zang, where um, the trades wanted to get, they wanted to know where the own manual was for um, the multi-stack uh, heat pumps that we have in that building. And so not knowing where the project folder was, you know, I, I basically told them, I said, you know, you, you know you have this information on your iPad. They're like, no, we didn't know that. And so basically I just showed them how they were able to um, upload the model onto their iPad and basically go to that heat pump and click the link that was established, and they were able to pull the own manual up right then and there. Uh, other than that, they, they had no clue. And they were saying they were spending hours trying to find this own manual, and here it is right there in their iPad. So that's why I think they've really bought into this process because you know they spent many, they spent hours and hours in our document room just looking up information, um, asking our students to print out drawings and print out you know O and M manuals. So you know they were able when they saw this they were like wow that really cuts you know our time spent searching for information down to the day they even pull it up with our iPad. So they're really seeing the benefit of it. No, oh, absolutely. That's um, that's a big part of most of our world facilities is just quickly finding the right information. Um, which leads me to the next question is, you know, how do you ensure that the information to keep everything current is communicated to you? If you do get a new cart that requires a new manual link or if, you know, a, a renovation changes your model. How is that information communicated to you? That's one of the things that we are working on right now. That's the one part that is still kind of, it's kind of our next phase. Because one of our challenges is, and it comes from our PM scheduler, is 
it does not communicate effectively to her when the equipment has been changed out. Um, and same thing with us, and you know, with you know, I work closely with our CAD document coordinator, um, Janie Hart, and one of the things that she has challenges with is that we don't know all the small projects that go on here on our campus. I'm pretty sure um, the other people on the call in the same way. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, get a process in place. So we're still working on that piece. Um, so that's still kind of that's still kind of broke. The only time that really really we know is when our students go out there to feel verify something. Because um, um, we do um, do our simple floor plans of space changes, and so we don't know what space changed physically unless the building coordinator tells us or if our students happen to go in and do a building audit to see what spaces have changed. So that process still has to be worked out. Yeah, I think that's a, a common thread we all share. Um, okay, I have a couple of questions for you from, from out in our audience. Um, one is from uh, Daniel Sward. He asks, are your BIM models spatially aware? Is there any integration of your BIM and CMMS with GIS systems? Um, right now, we have been having multiple discussions with um, Daniel Liss and Nepshi. He's part. Uh, he's our GIS manager here. Uh, we've been having multiple conversations about that. Um, right now, I know most of our spatial thing is done using Famous. Uh, we do have Famous here, so um, that's used for all of our space um, analysis, I guess you want to say. Um, and Janie and her staff, you know, do make sure that, you know, our simple floor plans are kept up to date as much as possible so that, you know, the information within FAMIS is accurate. Um, but right now, we're still trying to establish that link between BIM and GIS. And so right now, that's one of the reasons why we've been going to all these different conferences to try to get a better understanding of how other universities are kind of think the two. Um, right now, we're not quite there. Um, our GIS people are just doing their GIS maps. We're doing our models, and we're hoping that there's something out there that can kind of link the two together. Indeed. Um, so is that link we're trying to establish as more Correct. and more systems are, are are, are chosen by different areas. We just, you know, we, we rely on that link. So good work with you for helping to push that. Um, here's a question from Tim Armstrong here at the University of Kentucky. Uh, he okay. asks, is Next Step electrical in regards to transformers, switchgear, motor control centers, etc., or what? Uh, well, if I go based on what I think my supervisor might say, I think his next step would be for us to get all of our um, valves in, all of our isolation valves, shut off valves um, in next, because um, we do have AutoCAD drawings of those valve locations, and so I think that's the next step for us, possibly. Uh, I know our lighting crew would love to see our light fixtures in, um, get in um, to the model. Um, so right now, I think it's going to be a toss-up between um, valves and electrical um, because that, they both see the benefit because they're so, they've seen what we do for new, <laughs> the information that we get from new construction, was, which is a lot, and they're pushing us to try to get our existing buildings up to that point. So we're just trying to decipher which is next. So it's not somewhere between valve and electrical, not for sure yet. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, here's a question from my buddy up north, Tom McCaffrey from University of Calgary. He asks, how did you quantify the savings in time and money from your work order system? Um, basically what we did is kind of survey our trades to kind of get a a feel for, um, because we log, we have a re annual report that's done about how much time is spent on from when a work order is open to when it's closed. And so we basically sat down with them to really um, survey them to get an understanding with this new tool how much time they would guesstimate on will reduce their actual time out in the field. So 
our savings was kind of based on, um, on with the people that actually do the work. And so that's how it is very conservative, we think. Um, and so um, that's where the numbers come, come from. It's basically sitting down with them to get an understanding of how much time they're spending today with this tool, how much time do they estimate that they can cut down on the work orders. Okay, great. Uh, here is a question from Graham Smith in Ontario with Bruce Power. He asks, does your mobile viewer use Wi-Fi to geolocate the user to the model, or do they have to pan the model as they walk around the building? No, the cool thing, is, which is really cool, uh, we do have Wi-Fi here on campus. So um, I think once, um, I think you just have to I um, really need the Wi-Fi to upload. No, once you have the Sim 3C Blue app on your, on your um, device, and you have the, the, the model uploaded to that, there is a button. I wish I had an iPad here I could show you, but there is a button on within the app that geo reference you to the space. So if you push that button, it basically puts you into that reference point of the building. Um, if I had the iPad, I could show you that and bring it with me today because I have time to show you guys this. But the really cool thing about uh, Ben 360 Blue, it does that. There is a, there's an icon within that app that if you press it, you press it down, it basically, your reference you to that point within the building, and you can pan around without even leaving your office, and it puts you physically within that spot in that room, and you can just use your iPad and hang around, look around. It's pretty cool. Um, so I do apologize not bringing an app, I mean, bringing an iPad with me to show that with you guys. Um, but um, that's it. Ben 360 Blue. If you haven't got it on the iPad, um, definitely go and see some of the YouTube videos they have with it. And it's a really cool app. Um, it's free. Uh, it's free from um, through um, Apple, if you have an Apple device. Well, we'll just have to have you show us that at the at the next CFTA six month webinar series, right? Welcome to that. Day <laughs> two. Okay, our last question uh, comes from uh, Sam Lingaman from University of New Hampshire, and he asks, "How do you justify to upper management the investment or need for moving to BIM from 2D CAD, and how do you justify uh, to them the cost benefit?" That's a really good one. Um, well, the cost benefit for us is that we do have a really, um, our associate vice president is really on top of the new age technology that's coming out. He goes to all the various conferences, uh, um, all of this university and so forth. So he's really in tune to what is out there. Um, and with this one, uh, one of the things that he was really focused on from 2011 to 2013 was getting all of our buildings modeled. Um, so he really pushed that time frame. It was a really hard push to get all of our buildings modeled on campus um, because it was more for to give students and parents the opportunity to see, you know, the buildings that their students might be going to. And then when uh, the iPads came along when we switched over from uh, our TMS to web TMA, the iPad was added on to that. It was kind of like, oh, well, you know, since we have these iPads, there is an app called Ben 360 Blue that we can use. So it just kind of fit right in. Um, he's, like I say, he's very um, progressive as far as it comes to um, making sure that we're util utilizing the latest and greatest. Um, that's why he really, you know, uh, informs us to get involved in as many different conferences as possible. Um, so that's really been helpful for us because he's he's very progressive in that nature. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much. Um, we are just about out of time. And just like that, uh, we're ending perfectly. All the questions have been answered. So, you know, we're going to go ahead and, um, and close our webinar for today. And I do want to thank 
you very much for taking your time to share your journey with them and your strategies with us. I'd also mm -hmm. like to thank the attendees who joined us today uh, and remind them if anyone does have any questions or want to continue dialogue with Devon, I'm sure he will welcome that dialogue. And his contact information is available on the CSTA website um, in this webinar series information. The next webinar in the Geotech Showcase is scheduled for April 2nd. The presenter will be Jose Delgado, who will be continuing the BIM theme by presenting on BIM standards and contractor submittal requirements at the University of Southern California. For more information on future webinars in the series, visit the CFTA website at www.cfta.org. Thank you, Devon. Thank you. Much.